welcome you to our class this morning. I appreciate each of you uh, being here. I just really didn't know how today was going to go. As I walked out this morning, getting ready to go to the jail, a nice black and white skunk looked me right in the eye as I walked out the door. I didn't move. And he sort of waddled off down the sidewalk, and I was so glad. And he gave me a spraying welcome. We did have four different worship services at the jail this morning, so they must be getting close to court date. More people are interested in being in worship service. We're glad that you're here for our class. If you'll uh, notice in the worship bulletin, there are several listed as sick. Uh, Randy Moore is still in the Magnolia Hospital in ICU following surgery. Tony Farr, that's uh, Toy's brother, is in Tupelo Hospital following a logging accident. Rachel Whitley Daniels is at home following surgery. Don Dawson is at home. Uh, Margie Bray, that's uh, Larry Morgan's sister, needs to be re remembered in our prayer. And Ripple Bullard, that's Lisa Allen's mom, also needs to be remembered in our prayers. I was given a note. Uh, George Darst, that's a classmate of D. Worley, was diagnosed with ALS. Some of us call that Lou Gehrig's disease. Since that time, his overall health has deteriorated. Please pray for George and his wife, Penny. Are there others that we need to be remembering in prayer this morning? I know we've got a lot of flu and we need to remember all of those, but other than that, do any of you know of anything else? Would you bow with me, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your blessings. We're thankful that we can begin this morning and study of your word and continue it with worship to thee and we pray that all that we do is pleasing in your sight we do pray father that you would be with george darst as he endures this uh, terrible disease we pray especially for his wife penny we pray that you would help us as your servants to reach out to those that are in need Father, we ask your special care to be with uh, Brother Randy Moore, to be with Tony Farr, with Rachel, Rachel Whitley Daniels, with Don Dawson, with Margie Bray, with Ripple Bullard. And we ask your blessings to be upon our class this morning as we uh, try to understand the importance of repentance from the example of David. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We had four different intents of our lesson. One was to understand what the scripture says about each of these people. And two weeks ago, we had studied about David. Uh, the second is we wanted to examine the potential motivation for their behavior and the devices used by the devil. Um, in David's case, some of it is the circumstances that we put ourselves in. While all the other kings were out fighting battles, David was taking some time off. May idleness can be the devil's workshop. And third, we wanted to look at the impact of their sin on themselves and others. And then fourth, we wanted to identify lessons applicable to ourselves so we can avoid similar sins. <clears throat> As I said, we studied about David uh, two weeks ago. We studied the sin, we studied the cover-up, we studied the uncovering when Nathan came and talked to him. And today we plan to finish that study by focusing on David's repentance. If you still have your study guides, and we've given out the last copy of the study guides, uh, but if you have your study guide, that study of David starts on page 41. The repentance section is on page 45. 
we identified a multitude of sins. I don't know if I've captured all of them, but David, when he started sinning, he, he just got carried away with it. He lusted after Bathsheba. He sent servants to take her. He committed adultery with her. He tried to hide his sin by having Uriah have sex with his wife. He intentionally got Uriah drunk so he would not stand by his convictions. He sent a message to Joab to murder Uriah via the battle plan. And in that plan, not only was Uriah killed, but there were other soldiers that were killed. That's not a very good list to stand in front of God with. Uh, Nathan had his famous statement after he uh, shared with him the situation about the traveler being uh, honored by having the sheep of a, I guess we'd call it a sharecropper, uh, killed for the, for the meal. And David got incensed. Who in the world would do such a terrible thing? And Nathan told him, Thou art the man. Well, David is given credit for writing about half of the Psalms in the book of Psalms. And these Psalms are not arranged in chronological order. I did some research on the 75 or so Psalms that David did write. And the best guess of when they were written and then sorted them by the dates that they were written and found that David wrote four Psalms in 1034 B.C. That's the year of his repentance. That was the 32nd, the 33rd, the 51st, and the 103rd Psalm. All of these Psalms dealt with either his pardon or the confession of his sins or the benefit of forgiveness from God. And it seems clear that Psalm 51 was written before Psalm 32, 33, and 103 because Psalm 51 is where he so eloquently asked God for forgiveness. And in the other three Psalms, they all acknowledge or specify benefits for a, to a forgiven, forgiven person. I want us to do a brief look at each of these other psalms and then go to Psalm 51 in more detail. I did not, at the time I put together your study guide, put any reference to Psalm 32, 33, or 103, so you won't find this information in your study guide. In Psalm 32, which is sometimes entitled, The Joy of Forgiveness, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer." I want you to, did you notice the contrast there in feelings before and after his confession? And, and I noticed as I was reading it just then that, that David gives God some credit for his bad feelings. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You know, just like Adam in the garden, God knows when we're trying to hide our, our sins from him. And David says that he acknowledged his sin to God and God forgave his iniquity or the iniquity of his sins. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. You know, being able to go again to God in prayer is such a great blessing to the one who has confessed. You know, sin separates us from God. 
And, and if we have contaminated our soul with sin, it's got to be a, a, like a dark cloud over us because, you know, there are always going to be times in our lives when we have uh, run out of options and the only option is to turn back to God. And yet, if we are contaminated with sin, we have no hope that God's going to listen to us. And so I can understand David like breathing a sigh of relief because he's been forgiven because now he can turn to God again. Now he can have confidence in God's protection in time of trouble. And this psalm also points to the providence of God as a blessing for the forgiven. I will trust you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. This is sort of a flip in who's doing the talking here. This seems to be God doing the talking to David in this part of the psalm. Now that David has confessed and repented of his sins, he's allowing God's word to be his guide. Uh, then uh, I think when Nathan came to him, the story he shared became the bit in David's mouth to turn him back to God. He was like one of those horses or mules that needed some special turning to get back to God. And Nathan was so effective in the parable that he shared with him and then saying, Thou art the man. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord's mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. You know, David acknowledges here that he's gone from the sorrows to the very other opposite end of the emotional spectrum. He's able to shout and sing praises to God where he was not able to do that. When you go on to Psalm 33, you know, reading this psalm, which was also written in the year of David's repentance, it reminded me of the words of our song, How Great Thou Art. Because David here acknowledges that God is worthy of praise in music and song. I want you to notice the following verses from Psalm 33, beginning in verse 4. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all of the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Just notice how, God, how David acknowledges God's awesome power. If you look at, at verses 8 and 9, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Now just think how differently David is thinking now than he was when he was walking on his roof and seeing Bathsheba. He had... He was thinking of self at that time, and now as he writes this psalm, he's thinking of God and the awesomeness of God. The counsel and plans of the Lord are perfect compared to those of man. That's one of his themes there. And through the providence of God, nations are defeated and God's plans are fulfilled. And then he speaks this truth in verse 13. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. I don't know about you, but it has been a breath of fresh air to me to hear how many times President Trump refers to God in the speeches that he makes. Uh, all of us know that he is not a perfect man, but at least he acknowledges who is the Creator and who is the source of all power, and who is the source of all blessings in our country. 
And if we're going to be a country that is blessed, God has got to be our Lord. The counsel and plans of the Lord are perfect compared to those of man. All right, I believe I just did that. God is watching all of us and considers everything that we do is another theme that he had through there. Then as we uh, look at verses 16 through 19, God's power is greater than no man's, than man's power. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. When I think about that, I think about the time that that one angel killed 187,000 soldiers. We just don't need to put our confidence in the size of the army alone. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is in His unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. David ends that psalm by expressing his hope and trust in the Lord. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. The 103rd Psalm starts like David is saying his life has had a fresh start. And you may have seen people who've walked down the aisle and, and confessed sin and tears flow from their eyes you know that there is sincerity in their confession and it's like a load has been lifted from them. See if any of that jumps out here in the 103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. In the second stanza of the psalm, David addresses the mercy of God. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. I could almost say an amen to that because it's just hard to believe that God has been so merciful and forgiving to David after that tremendous list of sins that we showed earlier. I'm re really reminded of Hebrews 2, verses 1 and 2. Because there will become a day when all of us will have to stand before God in judgment and give account for what we have done here. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? As we read on in that psalm, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgression from us. You know, this is a pretty heavy thought here. God is so great in His mercy when we demonstrate that we fear Him. You just think of how sinful David was, and yet now he's able to write that he has removed my transgressions from me as far as the east is 
from the West. There is not enough vocabulary in the, any human language to describe how great the forgiveness of God can be. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. David ends that psalm by contrasting man as compared to God, and since God's goodness lasts forever, why would we ever side with the devil? As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to God's, to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. We can see that these three psalms focus on God rather than himself. I want us now to make this transition and let's move backwards to Psalm 51 and see how David went from being this Sinful man condemned by God to a man forgiven by God. By the way, as I looked at the list, the chronological list of the Psalms that David wrote, as near as I can tell, during his time of sinfulness, he was not writing Psalms. It was a period, a dead time in terms of writing Holy Scripture for David. And now we have David approaching God. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. What can we learn from what David, how David requests, or what David requested of God? What was it that David wanted? He wanted forgiveness. How much forgiveness does he want? He wants total cleansing. Forgiveness is not an entitlement. It's a product of God and His loving kindness. When God forgives, it's a manifestation of the multitude of His tender mercies. David is asking here for complete forgiveness. He wants complete separation from sin. I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. This was a question in your study guide. Even though David's sin impacted many people, he said in his prayer to God, against you, you only have I sinned. Would someone please explain why David said this? Against you, you only have I sinned. I, that's a beautiful answer. Sin is a transgression of God's law. And so when you sin... It is God that you're offending. Now, I know that there were people that were impacted. And sin always impacts us negatively. And it usually impacts those around us. And sometimes sin can have a long-lasting impact. I mean, all of us are experiencing the product of Adam and Eve's Sin, however, as was indicated, since sin is always violating God's instructions or expectation, it is against Him. Remember there in Matthew 25, at the judgment scene, when all of those people had opportunities to be helped, 
whether it was hungry or thirsty or naked or sick or in prison, when did we serve you? Or when did we fail to serve you? And how did Jesus answer that? If you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. When David sinned against Bathsheba, he did it against God. When David killed Uriah the Hittite, he did it against God. When all of those innocent soldiers fell at the wall, he did it against God. It's got consequences. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. I'm going to just make some of my own observations here on this. Uh, David is saying that he was as bad as it gets, but that God desired him to know truth from the point of his conception. In Job the 14th chapter and verse 4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? I looked at several commentaries on this. The Benson commentary states, Nor is it unusual with good men when confessing their own sins before God to make mention of the sins of their parents for their greater mortification and humiliation. This is a way of David humbling himself. He's basically saying, I've got no good in me. I'm as bad as it gets. But what you wanted for me was for me to know the truth right from the point of conception. In case you were wondering, this is one of those places in the Bible that talks about where life begins. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. This is not in your study guide, so you're just going to have to think quickly here. Why do you think David is asking God... Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Sister Mason says he wanted some peace and forgiveness. And forgiveness. Well, if he says, make me hear joy and gladness, what is he not doing? He's not happy. He, you ever do something and your conscience sort of hurts you? You know, it just, just ruins your whole day. Well, David's had his whole year ruined. And he, it's going to take some extra measures to get back to the point where he was enjoying being a righteous person and spiritual. And, and he needs help getting there. It's not, not just that he confessed, yep, I did that, Nathan. He's got to reestablish his spirituality, and he needs God's help to reestablish his spirituality. Sin impacts the emotions, joy and gladness. Even when God has forgiven our sins, sometimes it's hard for us to forgive ourselves. And I think that David is not only asking for forgiveness, help me to return to be a righteous person, but help me to feel like a righteous person once again. I think that Sister Mason says sometimes it's harder for us to forgive ourselves than it is for God. I think that's true. It certainly was for Paul where he called himself the chief of sinners. David goes on to say, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David wants a clean heart. And what he had when Nathan spoke to him was anything but a clean heart. At one time, David had been a steadfast warrior for the Lord. He had decided not even to go to battle at the time that he sinned with Bathsheba. And he wants to return to that state of being a steadfast warrior. He wants the intentional presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. You know, I'm thinking about our verse. That's our theme for this year. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, David prayed that he would be steadfast. And that's one of the things that we want to be as a congregation. Uh, it is a part of our theme in 2018. I don't know about you, but I know when we had Brad Harab here, and some of you may have been in the audience for Brad Harab. Some of you may have been watching him on YouTube. But most of the congregation was not steadfast. Most of the congregation was not abounding in the work of the Lord. Most of the congregation made a conscious decision to avoid that teaching. That's different than what, where we would expect the congregation to be if we're going to follow 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Now this is just a thought question. I did not put my own answer up there to that because quite candidly I don't know. But it's something that I think about. Is this a bargain with God or is David saying that when he is forgiven then he would be in a position to work for God. Now look there what he said. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and, I, and, behold, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach your transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. What do you think? Is he bargaining with God or is he just making a statement of fact? When I become a righteous person again, this is what a righteous person does. Just think about it. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praises, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. David was guilty of shedding innocent blood. He killed Uriah and those other collateral damage soldier deaths. And it's not surprising that David would ask God to forgive him from the guilt of bloodshed. That is correct. He had the death of the child to he and Bathsheba, or to him and Bathsheba. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem, then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. I'm hitting the wrong button there. Based on what David said in Psalm 51, what had been the impact of sin on his life? How would you describe the impact of sin on David's life? He 
He was a broken man, a spiritually broken man. By the way, you know, uh, even though he was forgiven of his sins, I don't know whether I put this up there on any of the slides, but he had to live with the consequences of sin. God forgave him, but he had a lot of problems with his children and holding on to the kingdom and with his wives and, uh, and what was done with them publicly. Uh, when we sin, we, we can get forgiven of it, but sometimes when we sin, we have to face the consequences. Many of the people that I was talking to this morning in jail have been baptized. They've been forgiven, but that didn't get them out of jail. They have committed sins, and those sins may keep some of them in jail for a long period of time. And David faced consequences of his sin while here on earth as well. Brother Mormon says that it just reminds us that even though we're forgiven of sin, it's just forever eaten on our conscience. It's hard to get it out of our head. And even if there's no other consequence that continues on with the sin, the mental consequence is tremendous. I just went back through Psalm 51 and picked up some of the things that David said and my sin is always before me. He felt dirty when he said, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Watch me and I shall be whiter than snow. Which would, the flip side of that is, I'm not that way right now. He, he stopped feeling joy and gladness. He no longer felt the Lord's presence. He had stopped teaching transgressors. He had stopped singing praises to God. All of those were impacts on his life, much of which is his spiritual life. What did David say he would do if God would forgive him? Well, let's just look there again at verses 14 and 15. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. What do you think we should gather? What should we learn? What's applicable to us from having studied about this incident or series of incidents in David's life? What should we learn? Sin is a slippery slope, Janita says. What else should we learn? Sister Martin points out that when God forgives, He forgets. And, and maybe sometimes, I, I'm putting words in your mouth here, but maybe sometimes we just bother Him by asking again for forgiveness of something He's already forgiven us. Maybe we need to forgive ourselves and then move on with serving Him. Right. David?
it is a deep thought. The thing that, that I get when I, when I look at all of this is don't overlook the fact that God will forgive. If God forgave David for all of this awesome sin, none of us have done anything that is so bad that if we will turn back to God, He won't forgive. He will forgive us. Sir? His up is like a sponge. It's a plant. You know, you remember in the Passover when uh, they put the blood on the doorpost and they put it on hyssop and then mark it on the doorpost. I got that from my wife. All right. Okay, remember that this is Fried Hardeman Lectureship Week. Uh, if you can go, that would be good. I know that uh, Fried Hardeman Associates are running a kitchen up there, and I know that because Janita's as is she's in charge of that. Uh, so I'm going to be gone with her up there most of the week. We're leaving after this service and, or after the worship service today, and so I won't be here tonight. But if you want to watch what's going on in the auditorium. It's going to be live streamed and put on the screen here uh, starting it in the morning. Brother Tommy told me about 8.30 and it'll try to keep it on all day so when anything, any program is going on in the Lloyd Auditorium at Freed Hardeman, it should be also seen or able to be see, seen here. Thank you all very much.